All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for everybody being here. Happy to have this on Thursday instead of Saturday for a change. Um, I do know we'd like to have it earlier in the day so we could have our East Coast people not be doing this from home unless that's where they work anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for being here. And uh, I think we got a lot on the agenda for today. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're gonna talk about three new studies, hopefully. Uh, is Dr. Mon here? Great, you get to start. Um, and then we'll talk about a trial and development and the uh, SWAG 2409. All right. That's how I do yeah. it. All right, so thank you so much. It's nice to be here. I think this is my first time attending this particular committee. Um, so I wanted to introduce you all to this clinical trial that we opened through the GU group. I'm Ben Mon, a GU medical oncologist at the Huntsman Cancer Center in Salt Lake City. So this is SWAG 2200, or we call it PAPMED2. Um, it's coming on the heels of a, a trial that was finished uh, just a few years ago, PAPMED1, or PAPMED as I call it, um, which, which really established the standard of care for um, this disease, which is the second most common type of kidney cancer, but that only represents about 15% of all kidney cancer cases. So it is a pretty rare disease. So this is the trial I was referring to led by Dr. Powell at the City of Hope, uh, where he was comparing a, a couple of different TKIs. And the, the trial or the, the arm that had the best progression free survival is cabozantinib. So this really established cabozantinib as the current standard of care. But one of the unique challenges that I'm sure you're all aware of that we have in kidney cancer is that despite having a variety of histologies similar to any other organ disease, um, the FDA, like all of the trials for the most part are done in clear cell kidney cancer, but the FDA and other uh, regulatory bodies approve the treatments regardless of tissue histology, right? So they say lenvatinib and pembrolizumab or ipinevo can be used in kidney cancer, right? So we do have some data about these other more common, you know, clear cell based uh, treatments in papillary kidney cancer, but they're all single arm uh, institution studies. Um, so, for instance, uh, in Keynote 427, which was single agent pembrolizumab in a variety of histologies, you can see the most common type of, of histology that was enrolled was papillary, which is not surprising. And there is a response rate with pembrolizumab in papillary kidney cancer. Um, what about the combinations? So this was a, a, an investigator-led trial in IAT at Memorial Sloan Kettering, led by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Lee, where he was looking at cabozantinib and nivolumab. Again, another FDA-approved combination. Um, there were two cohorts in this study. Cohort one was papillary, cohort two was chromophobe, so ignore chromophobe for a moment. Um, but in the papillary cohort, which was about 40 patients, um, you can see that there were responses as well. Uh, somewhere about 50% of patients had an objective response. Um, and, and you can see that very few patients, so that the brown on the side is cohort two, so igno or ignore those uh, pieces for a moment. But, but as you can see, the majority of the patients are having um, some type of, of response or stable disease. So this led us to postulate that um, the combination of a TKI plus an IO therapy can be effective in uh, papillary kidney cancer. But again, I think it's important that we really prove this in a randomized way, since we all know that single arm trials can overestimate the magnitude of effect uh, that, that we see in single arm studies. So it's possible, right? The null hypothesis is that single agent therapy, sequential single agent therapy with like starting with cabozantinib and maybe subsequently doing the volumab or pembrolizumab or whatever is gonna be equally effective for this specific disease type. So this is our trial design. So patients uh, have with metastatic papillary kidney cancer that have zero to one prior lines of therapy uh, can be enrolled and they're randomized to cabozantinib or the combination of cabozantinib and atezolizumab. Because cabomonotherapy is the standard of care, we felt it was important to keep the dose of cabozantinib equal across both arms. So of note, this is a higher dose than is used in the cabonevo combination, for instance. 
that we see for, for clear cell kidney cancer. Um, so again, patients cannot have prior exposure to cabozantinib. Adjuvant IO therapy is allowed, um, but there's a time frame that you must have discontinued, you know, more than six months before. And our sample size is 200 patients, randomized equally one-to-one -one between two treatment arms. So, so the, and, and there's a futility analysis plan. So the big reason that I wanted to um, present uh, this study is because we uh, we recently opened um, about a year ago, plus you know the lag, you know lead in time. So we've started enrolling patients. We have six now. There's a number of sites that are open: NCORE sites, academic sites, et cetera. And I'm trying to explore the opportunity of opening this through the VA system across the United States. Um, one one unique challenge that we have with this trial that we didn't with the first version is that this trial at that time was also open in Canada. Um, they have elected not to participate and they represented about 20% of all the total patients enrolled on the first study. So we we either it's going to take longer to do this study than the previous one or we have to find more places to open it up at. And since this is a rare trial, the number the our ability is is hugely our ability to enroll is going to be hugely proportional to the number of sites open because with rare cancers any one individual site is likely not going to enroll that many patients indeed if you look at the enrollment per site with patmat1 um, the the mean or the the median was one uh, one or two uh, depending on how how you calculate it like the mean or the median but anyway, most sites were enrolling one, maybe two patients on the trial, which is what I would expect for rare cancer. So the number of sites that we can get open will be hugely helpful. And so I think opening through the VA mechanism makes sense. So um, that's where we are with this study. Any questions? And then I guess I just wanted, if I could take a moment to sort of get your feedback about about this trial design, do you, are there unique challenges that it may possess, you know, in, in its current form in the VA system? Um, since I don't work in the VA system, you will be better equipped to tell me. And and I've never opened it through the VA mechanism, so certainly your input and experience would be helpful as well. I agree with the challenges of enrolling into this trial being a rare tumor. Again, the dose of cabozantinib seems to be a bit high. What's that last comment? Dose of cabozantinib. Oh, yes. Yeah. So so the dose of cabozantinib was picked because of what we learned from uh, the, the prior study, which was a forearm trial. I sort of blew through it pretty quickly, but it was cabozantinib. All of these are monotherapies, cabozantinib, crizotinib, savolitinib, and sunitinib. And in that trial, the dose was 60 milligrams. And there was a dose response uh, relationship, obviously, and that's similar to what we see in the clear cell kidney cancer study. So to give adequate justice, I suppose, if you can describe it that way, to the control arm, we felt 60 milligrams was the right dose to start with for the monotherapy, which creates a challenge then when you're trying to compare the, ca because cabozantinib is in both arms, when you're trying to compare the results with cabozantinib, the 60 milligrams versus 40 milligrams, if the results are equal or inferior, then you could perhaps start making some arguments that maybe it was solely due to the dose of cabozantinib. So that's why we elected to start with the highest dose and certainly allow for dose modifications and decreases. Hey, Mike Liss, so I, that's the San Antonio VA. So I was just kind of wondering maybe through tumor registry, we should identify the sites that treat a lot more of the kidney tumors because opening it every VA, I mean, a lot of VAs may not have as much kidney cancer as others. So maybe working through the tumor registry component and seeing which sites are high enrollers and then kind of working with those sites individually first and then opening it up. Some, I don't know, has anyone had success opening it at all VAs at the at one time? I don't think it's really still done kind of like that if you're if you're hoping for that. But usually it's- Can, can it's, I pause you there, sorry. Yeah. Um, so- because I'm new to this, it sounds like when you open at the VA, it still is very much like any individual academic center. You open it each one individually, and it's not like a centralized mechanism. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Well, there's a centralized mechanism as far as, you know, central IRB, 
and uh, a lot of our sites work together. So when one site opens it, it can make it easier for others to open. So there are some similarities, but each trial has to elect to open that study. Okay, so that's why I would say, you know, working with some of the tumor registries and um, I don't know, Stephen, if we have, if we have the ability to, when studies come up, can we look at tumor registries of and identify top five VAs that see that? We tumor. should probably look at Vinci too. Um, you know, do you request for preparatory research, which doesn't require IRB approval? Yeah. And just as long as we have the right parameters, uh, we can talk to the Vinci group in Salt Lake and, and see if um, that's something we could do on a regular basis. Yeah, because I think this request is going to come more often. And then just finding, oh, you know, Dallas VA has had seemed to have had a lot of these recently or San Antonio or uh, Portland or anywhere else. But you can kind of get a list of the top ones and start working with those PIs to see if they're interested in that. And then once it gets started, then some of the similar processes can happen. So it can open faster at those sites. So that's kind of how it works. That is a fantastic suggestion. Thank you. Okay. So who's the person I would contact to do this registry? Is there like a specific VA registry, I'm assuming? Um, you can help I us with think that. <laughs> <laughs> it probably comes down to me for right now, and then we're going to find who is going to be the right person. And I can help with GU stuff, you know, we can, but I don't know. We need to find who to contact in the, in the who has contacts at the registry that we can. Yeah, and um, I thought Michael Goodman was going to be on, but he's not responded to the chat. Uh, just maybe too late in Durham for, for him to be on. But um, I can talk to Michael too. He may have ideas of, okay. of the best ways to you know pursue at least for this particular one, and then we can develop a plan you know for future studies of making sure that you know we have populations and what the places to, you know, look forward to first, as opposed to just kind of you know, everybody at once. Yeah, the two things I was hoping for was getting the VA sites involved earlier, because sometimes we have more just different populations and, and um, like renal, renal function seems to be a problem with our patients too. So kind of getting a voice uh, when these are getting designed, and then second, providing that uh, list of sites that would be good enrollers for whatever studies that come through, I think us establishing that would be a good resource for us. Yeah, and for the GU committee, Michael Goodman is our uh, disease liaison uh, for GU. So uh, he can always be, he can reach out to you or vice versa uh, to see if there's a specific criteria within the protocol that you know need to be tweaked in order to make the VA population a little, a little easier to uh, enroll. This is Tashi from Salt Lake City VA. I'm I'm sorry, I'm the leukemia person, but because I'm at Salt Lake City, I work with Vinci uh, and Ben. You know, uh, we're colleagues at Huntsman. So, um, nice Doctor, yeah, hi Ben. So Doctor Halwani, you know Ahmad Halwani uh, in in hematology, he has the Vinci system here, Salt Lake City VA, and actually the National VA Vinci. So you can reach out to him directly for querying the Vinci. Okay, thank you. I'll have to do that. Any other any comments? other questions or uh, like does the protocol strike anybody in particular that something would need to be tweaked to uh, meet the VA population, or do you see any particular issue with the study for the VA? Hearing none. Um, all, right. Okay. all right, thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. And is uh, Dr. Rafael Santana, do we? There you are. Perfect. I just don't know all you by face, so it's. Uh, I have to do my best. Okay, so thank you for allowing me to present this study for you guys. Um, it's um, it's still in the planning uh, setting. We are going uh, to get approval from uh, the uh, Tarsi committee at the NCI, which is I understand the final approval before we develop uh, the protocol. We have 
uh, executive approval. So this is moving uh, along. I'm um, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm a, a thoracic oncologist at the, at the Hutch in Seattle. I used to be a VA doctor in Milwaukee in a previous life, but I've moved to, uh, uh, to Seattle. Uh, I am lucky to work with an excellent uh, group of uh, basic scientists uh, and a lot of, uh, of the science that I'm going to present is from their lab. So we are uh, doing a randomized uh, phase two study of um, continuation uh, immunotherapy, in this case, of the solicimab. Uh, versus uh, a standard of care in patients with extensive stage small cell lung cancer that have progressed to first line therapy. So as you all know, uh, the main uh, progress that we made in, in cancer in general and in small cell lung cancer as well is the, the ability of uh, immunotherapy to work great for some people. Okay, We know that not, not everybody responds, but there is a, the hope that uh, you have a, a uh, a prolonged uh, response. This happens in many cancers, as you know, like lung cancer and melanoma, but it's rare that it happens in uh, in a small cell. In a small cell, the benefit is, is marginal, and the patients that are uh, alive and well after two years are very small. This is um, not what we would expect because small cell is a very uh, mutated cancer uh, that in theory should respond well to uh, to immunotherapy. The curve here is what we see uh, from uh, the latest, I believe the latest um, uh, uh, survival publication of uh, atezolizumab versus uh, the then standard of care of uh, carboplatin and, and atoposide. And as you can see it, there is a benefit. The benef benefit is, is small uh, and we don't know why. We know that this is very likely multifactorial with um, uh, many reasons, but one of the main reasons is the low tumor cell expression of um, MHC1, which presents the antigen to the, the immune cell. So if the patient, if the cancer does not express the antigen, the immune cell is not gonna be able to recognize it. We also know that uh, neuroendocrine tumors have characteristics that prevent uh, immune cells to infiltrate the cancer. So we know that the, the, those are two of the main uh, characteristics of, um, uh, of why small cell evades the immune system. We also know from analysis of uh, clinical trials that reduced expression of uh, MHC1 and reduced expression of another protein that you'll hear more in a little bit called LSE1 is associated with um, benefit uh, from immunotherapy. Uh, we also know that in small cell, there are several epigenetic mechanisms that control the expression of MHC and that control everything, uh, or not everything, but a lot of things about the cancer. So our basic science colleagues over at the Hutch uh, have done experiments trying to modify the several epigenetic mechanisms, including uh, using um, an LSD1 inhibitor. So LSD1 is a uh, protein that has to do with... Um, uh, I don't know a lot of the science behind it, uh, but uh, has to do a lot to do with uh, the regulating uh, the uh, the epigenetics of uh, small cell lung cancer, and they started doing uh, preclinical models, and they noticed that there was a, a a mouse strain that had a dramatic response to LSD one inhibitor. This is the the one I um uh, oh this is mice uh, uh, this is this. So they tried to figure out why this mice had such an excellent response. And what they figured out is that with LSD1, it did reduce the, uh, the expression of, um, of, uh, of neuroendocrine characteristics. It also improved MHC expression. So the next experiment was to couple this with, um, uh, in, in, in a similar murine model to couple this with immunotherapy. And they noticed the same thing, that they were, uh, they were synergistic in, um, in rescuing uh, uh, mice and, and, and incrementing the effect of, uh, of the immune system. This was discovered at the same time at, uh, in Seattle at the Hutch, but as well as uh, in New York by, by another group uh, led by, by Charlie Rudin. Uh, LSD1 inhibitors actually have been uh, studied for a little bit. Uh, we have several that are being studied. The majority of, uh, of uh, situations in where it's, it's studied is in hematological uh, disorders. We know that, uh, that the main uh, adverse events are cytopenias. There are those dependent and get better once you stop uh, the medication. And it's also, they all have also have been studied in a multitude of, uh, of tumors, including small cell. This was a early study that was published in 2019. The study used a uh, one of the first generation LSD1 inhibitors and things didn't pan out. It did not show uh, any activity and the, the drug died. 
it did show that uh, that it caused the, the, the main side effects of uh, thrombocytopenia and more worrisome, uh, it did show that there was some encephalopathy associated with this drug. With newer generation LSD1 inhibitors, um, uh, this is not uh, no longer seen. But it makes sense that it has no activity. Uh, again, the purpose of, of uh, LSD1 inhibitor would be to increase uh, MHC1 expression and therefore make the tumor available to the, the immune system. This was done in the era before uh, immunotherapy. So because of all, all these science, we uh, proposed a uh, randomized control study where half the patients will be randomized to an LSD1 inhibitor, which is a, a pill. Uh, versus, with, I'm sorry, with a tesolizumab, a pd one inhibitor, uh, versus the current standard of care. And I know that if you ask uh, two oncologists what is the standard of care for small cell lung cancer, you'll get two different answers. So thinking of that, we said it's really dealer's choice between temozolomide, which can be either PO or IV, versus uh, lerbinectomy. Uh, again, th this is uh, some people uh, do labrinectin in thirst, some people do temozolomide because they're used to it, uh, is, is the choice in this case. The primary objective is compare progression free survival uh, across the two arms with several uh, sec uh, secondary objectives, such as describing the adverse events of these dr uh, drugs, looking at the overall survival. Mm -hmm. And also, very importantly, one of the other things that we're doing is um, uh, the same basic scientists have developed a uh, circulating tumor DNA analysis. It's not circulating tumor DNA, but there is a analysis of circulating blood where they are able to detect uh, specific abnormalities. Uh, and we're trying to see who are the patients that respond to these treatment, both in the investigational arm as well as the center of care arm. Uh, so we're doing uh, this as, as well. Uh, this is uh, the schema. Again, it's a very simple uh, patients that have progressed after uh, first line therapy will then randomize uh, to either the LSD1 inhibitor versus, uh, and atezolizumab versus investigator choice of, uh, of treatment. That randomization will be stratified as whether or not the patient has brain metastases and how long after the chemotherapy uh, was stopped did the patient uh, progress. This combination is a novel combination that has not been uh, used. LSD1 inhibitors have been used with uh, with other PD1 inhibitors, but this specific combination has not been used. So we're doing a, a safety cohort in the, uh, or a safety analysis, sorry, in the first 10 patients that are enrolled to the study. Uh, their eligibility criteria is very broad, is uh, patients that have progressed to, through small cell uh, lung cancer. They have had to have received uh, immunotherapy during the first line. We allow for the first cycle of immunotherapy to be done uh, with caroplatin and metoposide uh, alone. But after that, we do require the, uh, uh, either a tesolizumab or uh, derolumab. We do require the patients progress after uh, at least a month after finishing uh, chemotherapy, eco performance status of, uh, of more than, uh, I'm sorry, less than two, and absence of uh, uh, steroid requiring uh, brain metastases. I'm not going to bore you with the statistics because uh, they're very complicated to understand them, but uh, we are uh, looking for 96 uh, patients. Uh, like I said before, progression free survival was the primary uh, endpoint. We're obtaining uh, the agents from uh, from uh, CTEP uh, under CREDA agreements, uh, and the topotica and lobernectin done on the standard care arm uh, will need to come uh, from uh, from the site. Uh, again, the, the uh, we have uh, uh, obtained executive approval. Uh, one of the the comments from the executive committee is that small cell is common in the VA. We want to uh, to have VA uh, participate in in SOC, so it would be a win win for everybody to uh, to enroll patients and and to the study. Uh, the to tell you more of the the side effects of, of uh, the LSD one inhibitor, it does cause uh, thrombocytopenia as the main uh, adverse event. So we do require patients to have weekly uh, uh, blood draws while uh, during the first uh, cycle. Once uh, things are stable, then then uh, uh, they're not they're only required every every three weeks. Assessments is every uh, six weeks as uh, standard of care. Overall, I think it's a very uh, easy to to a uh, cruise study so with that I'll, I'll take any questions or comments that you can may have yes please hi uh, michael rose from uh, va in uh, west haven connecticut uh, thank you for uh, including us and certainly we see uh, a lot of small cells um i think a lot of us have the practice and it's also 
in the guidelines as far as I know that if a patient with small cell has progressed on maintenance, say atezolizumab, you will often go back to the original doublet if it has been more than six months. Mm -hmm. So um, that doesn't seem to be an option in so no, uh, so um, you're you're correct. Uh, the current guidelines, if, if a patient has been uh, has progressed more than than six months, consideration of uh, going back to a platinum uh, based treatment is um, uh, should be considered. And no, that would not be allowed here. Uh, but in my at least in my clinical experience, not everybody has a um, has a performance status to go on a platinum uh, doublet uh, treatment. Uh, so, so yes, we, if, if the patient enrolls into a trial, it would be randomized, uh, to single agent, uh, chemotherapy. Cause you are uh, requiring a response to chemotherapy initially. So you may have a lot of these patients, but less than uh, we, uh, we, so the requirement is only after a month. So, uh, so the, uh, is you finish the four rounds of, uh, treatment, you are the, you are eligible if you respond at least uh, within a month through any time after that. Yes, if you have a patient that uh, uh, that has an excellent performance status uh, and it's nine months, a year after diagnosis, yes, it's a, it's a choice to restart the, the chemothera uh, chemotherapy alone. Does the protocol specify what is the standard of care in the other arm? No, so the the we it's a dealer's choice between either lurbinectadine or topotecan, which can be IV or PO. But no therapy with supportive care is not allowed. I'm sorry, what was that? Just supportive care is no, not allowed. No, no supportive care is not would not be allowed. I'm Cheryl Serlanis. We've been communicating about yeah. this uh, via email. I think the attractive thing here is the inclusion of performance status to patients, which in the VA, especially in the second line setting, small cell and non-small cell, it is indicative of you know a good uh, portion of the population. So I think that's really attractive. And then the I do think that the choice between standard of care options also attractive. I think the, the one thing that may be an issue for some VAs is that given a fairly common disease and a low number of patients that are going to be accrued, that some VAs may opt not to open it because they perhaps couldn't open it fast enough mm -hmm. to enroll patients, but that's kind of part and parcel of, of the process. But overall, I think it's it's nice to have a second line study for small cell in our population. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you know, just check it online. There's no questions on the chat. Just, I just have one more thing. Sorry, sorry. Um, Jess McDermott, I work at the Rocky Mountain Regional VA. I would say for us, we were just chatting about this. I think, you know, second line small cell makes sense. We do have see a lot of them at the VA. The weekly blood draws may be a challenge for veterans, especially in a site like ours that sees a lot of folks who are driving hours sometimes to come to our facility and, and that it doesn't have to be central uh the, right. the key is that the, the cbc is drawn but if they, if they have it at their local uh facility that's allowed yeah if it's something you allow decentralized and that would yes. make a big difference yeah so, no it, that will be a, the yeah. centralized okay great any other questions thanks so much for thank you hey including us earlier in the process than most of the time and uh b for presenting to us today. oh my pleasure thank you and uh do we have any here from s2409 come on down Listen. Thank you um, for the opportunity. Do I do this? Uh, we're going to continue the discussion on small cell. I'm, we're going to try to continue the next slide. It was, it was working fine. You know, you've got the big box. Oh, now maybe, maybe the window.
Okay. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to talk about uh, S2409. My name is Ann Cheng. Uh, I'm from Yale, uh, and um, we're very, very excited about this trial. Um, it's been a long time coming, <laughs> and uh, I see many, I see folks in the audience that uh, have been involved. So thank you. Um, so this is the background. Uh, those of you, and it, I think, you know, we, uh, I'm, I'm the executive officer for the Lung Committee. We really appreciate the VA um, contribution to uh, accruals and it, in terms of Pragmatica, this is really amazing. So thank you very much. Uh, and I think that we see um, a real opportunity as you see by, by the previous presentation too, to involve you earlier. Uh, get your input into these these trials. So this is a has been approved internally, but we have not yet uh, um, submitted to the uh, TMSC the or are in the process. So any any um, uh, suggestions are are welcome. Okay, so you know that uh, small cell is about fifteen percent of newly diagnosed lung cancer, and that we still are. Uh, struggling with the median overall survival of little over a year, even with the addition of immunotherapy. Um, we think that some of those patients do better. Uh, I've had a patient who has been on a TISO for three years uh, and, and doing well, but not everybody does that well. And so we, we do think that there's an opportunity in the maintenance setting to, to um, take advantage of the good cytoreduction. And often patients have very good um, responses and, and they still have a good performance status. If, if anything, they've improved their performance status and, and this is a really great time to, um, to, to study. Uh, so the, uh, many of you are also aware of the, the new sort of paradigm shift in, in small cell that we're so excited about that um, non-small cell, we've been thinking of targeted therapy. We've been thinking that that's very heterogeneous. And so finally, now with, with small cell, we're thinking that there are different molecular subtypes. Uh, and um, this is Carl Gay and colleagues, who, and um, they're leading the translational part of this trial. They looked at that original Empower 133 trial for carboitope atizo, and they found that if they classified the, the small cell patients into different um, categories, and, and they used sub, there's different ways of doing it, but they use subtypes um, A, N, P, and I, I sort of standing for the inflammatory uh, subset. And they found that in that trial, if you were a subtype I, you actually enjoyed a better response to immunotherapy um, than in the placebo arm. So finally, first of all, that first inkling that, wow, we can identify certain subtypes of the patients who can respond to certain therapies. And so that was really the germination of uh, this collaboration to look at and take patients who in their first line, they're going through therapy, you know, they have to be treated right away, but then take the advantage of being able to get their tissue, figure out which subtype they have, and then randomize them to um, the biomarker directed or the subtype directed therapy versus versus standard of care. Um, so that is the hypothesis here. So uh, first of all, that you can do tissue-based screening during the induction chemoimmunotherapy that we can determine the subtypes from that and then allow the assignment of biomarker directed um, therapies. And then second of all would be that if you have a subtype directed therapy um, in the maintenance setting, if you add that to the DERVA compared to the, um, uh, the standard of care that will give you a better effect. But that's that's our hypothesis. And, and I will say that we will we're gonna do um, uh, profiling on all of these patients. So we'll really be able to understand what's going on. Um, so these are the tissue objectives. Uh, so we will get the tissue and then determine the subtype. Now there's A and, and those are really the neuroendocrine subtypes. And um, they sometimes overlap a little bit. So when we were trying to figure out how to, how to, how to design the trial, we said, finally, 
you know, let's just take the neuroendocrine subtypes A and N and put them in one category. And then, and then, and then of those, if you're Schlafen 11 positive, then you will get a PARP inhibitor plus DERVA versus DERVA alone. And, um, you know, this S1929, which you also helped with, there's the small cell uh, that showed benefit of adding a, a PARP inhibitor to DERVA. So uh, we already have data that that's a, a, that's a good approach and actually are using a PARP inhibitor, but a new improved PARP inhibitor to do that. Um, so that if you're A and N, that neuroendocrine subtype, and then you are Schlafen 11 negative, then you will go and have a different therapy. And in fact, we know from the preclinical work here is that if you are Schlafen 11 negative, you're actually, it's a synthetic lethal such that an ATR plays a really important role uh, in DNA repair. So the, in this case, we're using the ATR inhibitor plus DERVA versus DERVA alone. Um, and then finally, uh, well, I'm getting into the I'm getting into, so this is a tissue part. And then these are the actual cohorts. So the first one I talked about, the subtype A or N, and then Schlafen 11 positive, or subtype P. And subtype P we put together because subtype P also preclinically has really great data with PARP inhibitors. So we, we put them all into that subtype. And then if you're A or N and Schlafen 11 negative, then you get the ATR inhibitor versus um, plus DERVA versus DERVA alone. And then if you're subtype I, if you look at the preclinical data, um, you have overexpression of, of the NKG2A receptor. And so that is something that we can target with monolizumab. So let me just skip to this. So this is the subtype directed treatment. And depending on what your subtype is, you would get this drug, the PARP inhibitor, that's a new improved drug, uh, uh, um, PARP inhibitor AZ5306, the ATR inhibitor, which is if you're Schlafen 11 negative, seralacertib. Uh, and then again, if you are uh, subtype I, then you get the inhibitory, um, uh, we're blocking the inhibitory MHC1 receptor and uh, and, and, and in combination with DERVA versus DERVA alone. Um, here's the schema. So there's a screening step up front. Um, you, you, you know, obviously you need to have tissue available for testing. We're allowing asymptomatic or stable treated brain lesions. And then we, we understand that these patients often are started in the hospital because they're really sick. So we allow consent after that initial cycle to get the tissue and then get things going. And then, and then the next step would be the randomization. This is after you've finished the, the, um, the chemotherapy, four cycles of the chemotherapy plus DERVA. And, and then depending on your subtype, you're either randomized to DERVA plus that bio, that subtype directed agent versus DERVA alone. Um, the statistical assumptions, um, you know, we're actually taking pretty, we're, we're shooting for, you know, um, let, me, let me back up. We're shooting for 900 patients needing to be screened and we're using relatively uh, conservative estimations and data that we have from the S1929 trial in terms of how many patients are available. But I, I'm hopeful that, that we'll be able to um, accrue even better because the, the S1929 was only looking at Schlafen 11 positive patients. So I think anytime uh, you have the opportunity to put patients into different buckets, like in the lung, lung map situation, then you're, you're gonna be able to, to screen them and then you know, bring them on. But the, the number needed to be screened is 900 patients. The estimated duration of screening is 45 months. And then um, these, these slides here talk about the specific statistical assumptions and sample size per cohort. Um, in this case, the PARP inhibitor that we're using is a, sort of a new and improved, uh, has better brain penetration. So we are gonna have a 10 patient run-in. Um, and you know we're looking for about 40 patients annually uh, with a total of, of um, 
134 patients. Uh, that's in, assuming there, there's going to be about 10% ineligible. We're looking to achieve 120 eligible patients. So I won't go through all the details of all of the cohorts, um, but I will just throw up the screening eligibility. So this would be just for the step one. Uh, we're looking for, you know, basic histological, cytologically confirmed small cell. Um, they should have completed that first cycle. They need to have tissue for enrollment. Uh, to your, your comment, these are patients with um, PS zero to two and patients with asymptomatic brain mats. And then the second step um, uh, are, is pretty straightforward, but I will, um, I'll just stop there. I, I know it's late in the day and, and uh, they're probably, <laughs> everybody's <laughs> tired. So I'd be happy to hear your comments, get your input and get any feedback from you. Hi, Anne, and thank you so much for, again, including us. Um, I think this is a great study, and it's very exciting that we're finally in small cell, becoming a little bit more rational in our treatment choices. Um, one thing that I wonder about, and you may know the answer to this, uh, it's true when we biopsy patients for diagnosis, we don't know if they have small cell or non-small cell. Um, but it's my experience that Paradoxically, although the small cells have a lot of burden of disease, there's a lot of necrosis, and we often have poor quality tissue, and we've never worried about it because we haven't sequenced them, but I just worry that when we come to, okay, you have small cell, now we can screen you for this or enroll you in the screening phase of this study, we don't have enough tissue. Um, I don't know if you had trouble with the first phase, if that was an issue, but we may need a bit more education of our IR dogs, et cetera. Sometimes we make the diagnosis on not plural effusion. Sometimes we get just brushings and washings. So I just think that it might, and often we suspect ahead of time the patient has small cell, right? We can tell by the clinical presentation, the LDH, the aggressiveness. So I think it will require some education upfront um, in that regard. I think that's a terrific point. Um, I. I think that, you know, you, you're, you're absolutely on spot. These patients have bulky disease, right? And yes, sometimes we see necrosis, but for the most part, you can get really good biopsies from them. And I think that we haven't to date uh, for the most part, because we don't have a biomarker that we need to get. We don't have to get PDL one for these patients. We don't have to get EGFR molecular uh, testing. So I do think that this is a this will be a learning curve. I am very heartened by the the tissue that we were able to get in the S nineteen twenty nine um, for for the Schlafen eleven positivity, and we we don't need that many more slides. Um, the Carl Gay and Lauren Byers are actually uh, we're working with Boston Gene, and and we we will need. I think it's four four slides and then two extra slides for the slide. So it's it's a very reasonable amount, but I do think you're right. This is not a fine needle aspirate, so it will be you know education up front and really not for your for your institutions in terms of the the uh, IR docs and the other folks um, getting biopsies that this will be important. But I think that's where we need to go for the field for these small cell patients to be able to to get into other therapies that might help their survival. Sir, the first cycle could be chemotherapy with or without atezo is allowed. Yeah. The first cycle, then what happens? Yeah. If they're enrolled, do we switch to durvalumab from second cycle or only in the maintenance? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And, you know, I think that, um, uh, AZ would love for it to be Derva, but we talked to them and we said, look, there's a lot of patients who are getting a TISO. So uh, we really think that would affect accrual. So I, th I think that, you know, being able to be agnostic during the first uh, induction chemo IO, we, it would be important for accrual. Great question. Another sort of scenario my patients are running through my head. Um, because of lung cancer screening, we are actually diagnosing early sort of like stage one or two small cell. And then if they recur, obviously we're rebiopsying them, but uh, will it have, can it be older tissue? Um, is there data on that? Is, is this 
is the Mar Marcus Schlaffen and et cetera, are they, uh, do you need a recent biopsy or can you use the resection a year ago? Just something uh, you yeah. may want to think about. I love that question because first of all, it indicates that, you know, we do have pretty good, some good outcomes for patients who have early stage small cell who undergo surgery. Um, you know, I think ideally we'd love to have a biopsy at the time that they're progressing. Um, but I think this is going to be a learning process. I, you know, we've done, um, some, some, we have, I have a small translational study where we're looking at, um, a week, week, uh, or pretreatment and a week four biopsy for patients who have gotten ipinevo. And, and we see that for the most part, the subtypes are the same, but, but there is some, and, uh, Carl Gay and Lauren Byers have also seen a little bit of subtype switching. So, you know, I think that, um, I think that we, we would work through that, but that's a great, that's a great point. I, I think ideally what we'd love to have in the small cell, um, realm is to be able to have something at maintenance. And then if they progress, they go on to the, the LSD one inhibitor trial and, and that we would have just the, the perfect lineup for your patients who have, who have small cell. These are great, great points. Michelle. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that, um, so uh, Michelle's referring to a number of trials uh, that, that are looking at, that are looking at either immunotherapy uh, after chemo radiation or uh, with, or during and after chemo radiation. And, you know, they will have been exposed to um, immunotherapy, but I think that when they progress, and in this case, it may be important to have a, 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 rel a newer biopsy um, that, 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 that you're able to look at your subtype at that point in time. Dr. Solanas, any other comments on this one? Do you think your patients would go on this trial? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Dr. Slonis is going to tell us a little bit about how pragmatic is going and what we can do better. Thank you. I have the slides here. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So this uh, will be a little bit different in the sense that we are going to speak about the pragmatic lung study from a standpoint of uh, talking to sites and encouraging sites to open the study and talk about what some of the barriers may be to opening it in the VA. So we had a more formal discussion of the pragmatic lung study at a prior VA committee meeting. Uh, the study coming out from Dr. Rec um, Recamp and uh, team. So this is a pragmatic study. So a study done under usual conditions compared to optimal conditions, looking at patients who have previously treated stage four or recurrent non-small cell lung cancer. And so this particular trial is randomizing patients to either standard of care and that is investigator choice and the, the recommendation uh, per the study is that patients be enrolled or sorry, be treated with a treatment per NCCN guidelines. So fairly open. And then the other arm is ramucirumab and pembrolizumab. 
So patients have to have received both a platinum-based chemotherapy and then um, a checkpoint inhibitor therapy prior to enrollment. And so then the actual, because of the pragmatic design, the actual the actual sort of study procedures are fairly minimal looking to just define what is the overall survival between the groups and then looking at toxicity. So um, because we've discussed this before, we won't go into too much detail, but when we've talked about this study in the lung working group, the sense was that this would be a great study for the VA in the sense that the eligibility is fairly broad. Patients can have a performance status of two, which like we've discussed, many of our patients do in the second and subsequent line settings. The study um, is uh, accruing well, and the lung working group had wanted to see if there were any concerns or any barriers about open, opening this particular study in the VA um, or what people may have encountered. I think one of the comments is that sometimes there are questions that there aren't enough study procedures or that people aren't exactly sure what to do to, to make this study go, but just wanted to open the forum or their dis the discussion to any barriers or thoughts or whether sites have opened the study and what the experience has been. Does anyone have the study open yet? Yeah, and how has it gone so far? early stage. Yeah, we are as, as well. So it seems like something that should be quite easy to accrue to, but we're, even though we've had it open for a little while, we haven't quite found the right person yet. Any feedback to share or thoughts about, or concerns or any thoughts about opening it at sites? Okay. Well, thank you. Just putting it out there that it's an option and something that seems like a potential good fit for our population. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I did have the question uh, earlier this year from uh, Dr. Blank and Laura of, of uh, kind of why the VAs haven't jumped on Pragmatica more. Um, so if there are some specific things, whether it's operational or whatever it is, uh, let us know, because that's the kind of stuff we're supposed to be working on. And um, if if there's things we can do uh, or bring forward, uh, that would be tremendous. Yeah, and um, and just a comment because we have some folks online. I'm just gonna kind of repeat that. It's just what four more sites going to be opening and. And um, so hopefully, you know, we're kind of getting off the snide here and, and uh, moving forward a little bit. All right. Caitlin, could you use the microphone, please, just because the people online have no idea what we're doing. Jennifer Whitehead at San Antonio. Um, I know one of the, our barriers to open it or one of our thoughts is that it doesn't meet the LPOP requirements. And so a lot of our lung stuff that we're looking to open is a little more looking at targeted um, therapies, I guess. Yeah, and what would be the LPOP requirement that that is just targeted therapies? Yeah, it or? has to have like a genetic component, I guess. Is our our understanding is what our our hub site has um, given down to us essentially. If anybody has any other thoughts on on the LPOP requirements, because Dallas is our hub and. Um, their thought is that it has to be, it has to have a genetic component. Uh, I I highly doubt that that will be an issue for LPOP. Uh, I think they're just happy that patients with lung cancer get enrolled on clinical trial. I, I really wouldn't worry about that. I think it's the natural study coming out of lung map too. I mean, it was one of the it's taken from one of the arms of lung map, so um, I think it's sort of like a non-match. I, I really wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, so we can probably talk to Mark Klein or some others about, you know, uh, if there's some misconception about that, that we clear that up so maybe more people jump on board. 
I mean, the other way you could approach it is the patient gets screened for lung map, and if they don't have a target, if they don't have a match arm, they go on Pragmatica. So, yeah, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> Always solve the problems we got. <laughs> Caitlin. This is Caitlin Hutchinson from Rocky Mountain Regional VA. I would absolutely second that last statement because what we were just sitting here talking about is that we have lung map open and we've been really thrilled to have Pragmatica because of the design of the trial and the lack of solid tumor biopsy is huge for our site so we can consider Pragmatica. But if we could kind of have a step zero, step one registration step where we could be enrolling patients prior to progression, we have a lot of patients waiting in the wings to be approached and you don't want to watch and wait, you know, greedily for someone to progress. But at the same time, if we have patients we know will be interested, we could get them on a step zero and be ready to run as soon as that were to happen. Okay, anything else on, on Pragmatica? Any helpful comments? All right, so um, our next presentation is gonna be Site Perspectives from uh, uh, Jacqueline Gessick. Please uh, tell me if I got your name wrong. Uh, <laughs> Christine Summers and Samantha Young to kind of give us an overview of uh, challenges and successes for opening studies. Just tell me how I, how I move it forward. Well, I uh, just the button on the right. Okay. Just click to the right. And you can see it on the screen here. If it's easier, click over you. Oh, yeah. There you go. Okay, I'm relatively new and I'm so happy that I have friends in the room already after just a few <laughs> short years of being a, my background is in clinical, um, in, I had a clinic as a urology nurse for, for many years and I went through the VA to get my RN, so I'm forever grateful. And um, the White River Junction, oops, why is it doing that? How do I go back there? So about our facility, it's a relatively small uh, acute setting and we only have about 50 um, beds and we're on a huge uh, 64 acre uh, site in the Connecticut River Valley. We're called White River Junction because the White River and the Connecticut River join there. And that's where all the flooding was. If you heard about Vermont in the news, <laughs> we made the news for all the wrong reasons. Um, but our catch basin is 25,000 veterans that we actually serve for a lot of specialty services, which is why research has a um, strong presence there because of that. Um, and a lot, of, because we are a small facility, a lot of our um, specialty services use sister uh, facilities that are private sector that we use for like our radiation oncology is done at Dartmouth, uh, which is across the river, Connecticut River. And, um, oops, as it keep doing that. So a lot of the patients are also, we have a medical oncologist currently, and we're, we just recently hired a second one. So we are limited to what we do for some of our chemotherapy. And a lot of it does go to the community. So we we reach as far north as the Canadian border, um, west throughout Vermont, all the way over to the, Mass all the way down to the Massachusetts border. We do capture some of those patients. And um, there isn't a le same level uh, VA in the New Hampshire. So we have a very broad range of patients that we actually catch for our VA. Um, and most veterans will come to a VA facility regardless. Uh, even if they have the radiation oncology, they will come back to us for their for their treatments just because they, they like being part of the VA um, facility. So despite the fact that we're small, we have a lot of, um, these are our VA oncology studies and I'm the only oncology <laughs> coordinator presently. So I remain quite busy. Um, these were done prior to me. We had a big, robust oncology team and um, a lot of oncologists left. Then COVID came, as you know, and we lost a lot of coordinators. So, but despite that, these are all still active, not all actively enrolling, but active. And the for SWOG studies, we have the lung map. Uh, we do have the in investigational arm of the S1800. He just got the patient in under the wire before they closed accrual. But um, what is going I know it is. Don't freeze on it. Um, uh, so the alchemist and, we, and that uh, secondary, the substudy now is now open on the alchemist and PACE is, is closed to enrollment, just closed in June, but we do have patients in that as well. So for recruitment, we have only one coordinator. Our biggest, um, our biggest effort is actually at our clinical studies. So we see the patients. I have to order them up. 
with only one research coordinator, I predominantly do the clinical side first and then all the other efforts, even though I do screening and attend tumor board and do everything I can for recruitment, I am limited by time for that. And with one oncologist, again, she's also predominantly doing clinical, um, the clinical side. So research is not that it's taken a back seat. We still have active research, but the time element is just our limitation. And we did just recently hire a second oncology college, which hopefully will help. Despite that, we still do an um, engaged effort with LPAP, as somebody mentioned, and we do lung cancer screening, um, an effort to engage our community and let them be the lung cancer awareness. I didn't even go near it, I know. So, uh, <laughs> so um, in order for me to survive, I've actually reached out and I have uh, great friends in a lot of consortium, the Maverick Consortium and the other VA sites, West, uh, West Haven and Rhode Island have been essential to me to maintain my studies because they offer all that other knowledge and support and um, wouldn't have survived without them. So i greatly appreciative. So again, staffing is our biggest limitation, but um, on a positive note, we have been able to maintain all the studies that were started and open additional sub-studies despite that, just to keep the best um, studies open for patients. Uh, the other thing is the distance to travel. Like I mentioned, we do have a whole system of volunteers, over 100 volunteers that actually go out and bring patients to our facility. So large times the community the community is, um, um, they'll come into our service, but a lot of the radiation oncology, they will get into the upper Vermont or to Massachusetts or go to New Hampshire for some of that care. So the community care effort, lots of times. So some of the studies that involve radiation oncology, we would not engage in just because it would be difficult to ream in that data from other, so many sites. But um, again, patients still prefer to come here. We have a, um, a lot of patients that prefer the VA, so. Oh, can I touch it now? So I just showing it's beautiful Vermont. It is beautiful living there. The leaves were a little late, but that's sort of, but it's our biggest concern is staffing. And the only reason is corroboration, but actually in talking to everyone that was here at the SWAC, everybody's experiencing, no matter how large their sites are, the staffing overlap so that you're doing multiple jobs rather than one. And everywhere I see the same thing. Oh, oh. Christine, look at that, <laughs> the segue. So um, new to the new to the research, love it. Um, my veterans come first and um, they're an amazing population. So I love what I'm doing. I just need help. But again, thank you to all of you for that support. Hi everyone, my name is Samantha. I'm Christine, we're from West Haven. Um, we actually are gonna talk about our kind of success and challenges to opening Pragmatica. So, um, okay. So our site really has been pretty good about opening studies. Um, we have a good timeline. Typically we, for NCI trials, we can open a study Realistically, if everything aligned, we could open it in a month. Um, we do safety first, which we've never had an issue with our safety. Um, and then privacy office, ISSO. Not we we did we were better before, so we could get it open quickly, and then R and D. Um, and we have a very good relationship with our R and D. So usually we could typically, if we needed to do a month, I think our quickest we had for um chemo IO, which was an alchemist sub study. We opened in three days. We did it as an amendment. Um, I don't think we can do amendments like that anymore. That was a magical situation, um, but we did do one in three days. Um, I think typically now we're probably about two to three months, but Pragmatica has given us a little bit of trouble. Um, in our site, we are lucky. We do have five full-time coordinators. We are losing one, so we're down to four, but we are very lucky in that sense. So we do have one lead coordinator all the time and then a backup for every study. So we are lucky in our staffing at this moment. Um, so we are able to push a lot through and do a lot more studies, open a lot more studies. Um, and I think, but we have had our problems. Yes, so um, I'll talk just briefly about some challenges that we face while opening Pragmatica. So at the time, um, 
there was a brand new privacy officer and an acting privacy officer. Overall, they were understaffed. And as I'm sure almost everyone can relate to and understand the things and issues that can follow when a department is understaffed. Um, typically, like Christine kind of touched on, so our safety our uh, safety approval process takes about less than a month. Um, this one took over two months, I would say. There was a lot of back and forth for weeks between us coordinators and the specific privacy officer. And there were a lot of examples that I can give, but I'll just give one um, and not get too specific. But um, it was basically just very hard for us to understand the comments that she was making in terms of the revisions that she wanted us to make. We just couldn't really put together what she was asking. And it kind of just all boiled down to um, that department being understaffed and her kind of rushing through the comments and everything that she needed from us. So that was the last thing that where we then decided maybe it's best that we have a meeting. And so we can go through everything face to face and, and talk through everything. Um, so we ended up meeting, um, two coordinators and the privacy officer to kind of talk through everything. Um, we had to explain to her why we answered things the way we did, like, for example, on one of the applications or one of the forms, um, and, but it, and then she explained why she was doing the things that she was doing, um, Overall, like she was just trying to cross her T's and dot her I's like everybody else. Um, but it kind of just boiled down to them being understaffed. Um, from there, things went pretty seamlessly until the next challenge that uh, we faced. And Christine will talk a little bit about that. So I was just going to touch on the privacy office, too. Yeah. Um, it's universal. I think every single VA is having an issue and it's been brought up many times. I had a conversation with Megan the other day from Providence and Caitlin. We had our round table today. We brought it up again that there needs to be some kind of education to our privacy office. They don't do research. That's not their main focus. So to come, I think something from above needs to be some type of training needs to happen so that they can better understand what we're talking about. And we can all be on the same page because it's 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 hard. They don't know. They don't know what they don't know. So trying to explain every time gets hard. And then you're spending 30, 45 minutes, an hour on calls with them to try to teach them. But if there was something above that could really come down and just a simple training or just information that could go to the privacy officers. And I know one VA is one VA, but something to help. And I know that the ERDSP forms for ISSO, there is a national force being like they are taking that on. So that might be easier for every site, but the privacy, they're just, it could be difficult and challenging. And I think every single site is having this problem. So it would be amazing to have some type of knowledge, some type of training for the privacy office. Um, so then we did run into a very new problem that we were not expecting. Um, we do have a very great relationship with our research pharmacy. They are very much overworked. I I think at this time they have about 250 research protocols. Um, there are two research pharmacists, so they have a lot going on. Um, they were funded under research dollars, now they're clinical dollars, and I think that they need to kind of back themselves up. They need help and they need to prove that they need help, so they did change their um, charging fees. So they kind of wanted a lot of money <laughs> from us um, to open this study. I think it got up to like 24,000 to for the entire study, which is a lot of money. There's a lot of conversation. I don't want to scare other sites because I don't know that this is going to be something that every single research pharmacy is going to do. But for us locally, it was very much a challenge. And there's a lot of conversations, I think, with our ACOS and everybody else to try to straighten this all out. Um, I know Dr. Rose and Dr. Chow have been trying to fight this, so I don't want to go too far into it, but it really was a challenge. I think it's taken us about six months to open the study because of this research pharmacy budget. So finally, we, I think we've kind of hashed out what we could. And I just talked to research pharmacy and we are going to be opening October 24th. We are completely open, but we get to enroll. They said we can start enrollment hopefully on the 24th because I did say we have two patients that are coming. So please, like, can we please get this? So they did agree that it was important. They do know and they do appreciate 
us and we do have such a good working relationship. So once I dropped that two patients were potentially eligible coming in the next four weeks, they did agree. And now, so October 24th is like our kickoff. So we should be good to go. But that was a huge challenge for us. Um, very unexpected. I think it came quickly. Um, there is a new ACOS. So we've had a lot of staff turnover in that sense too, in the research office. So I think a lot of communication and things still have to happen, but we are there now. So um, like I said, I don't want to scare other sites because it was us, but it was something that was, that was tough. Um, and I think that's okay. it. We are short and sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? ladies. Um, I don't have a question about Pragmatica per se, but I know that West Haven has a little bit of a different process when they're submitting amendments or kind of follow-ups to R&D. Can you kind of elaborate on how that was established? Did you meet with your R&D to talk about that and how you were going to do it? And just kind of tell us kind of like your monthly like briefing that you send to R&D for all the NCI trials. Because I think that if other sites could maybe adopt that, that would ease the burden on regulatory things for a site. Yeah. Um, so I, I was I wasn't there when it started, but I, Monica probably knows. Um, we I think they there was a lot of conversation with R and D. Um, and at first when I first started, we were emailing our R and D. So if there was an amendment, we would email the R and D manager, um, the consent form and. He, I don't know, I, he would look at it just to make sure VA language was in there. That's all he cared about. Um, so we would have that highlighted. We would send it to him. He would just say, okay, to implement. And that would be our implementation. That was it for any amendments. So it didn't go through R&D. It was an email directly to him. Now IRBnet changed things. Um, so now for amendments, um, we do it ourselves. We say if there's an amendment, I will update the consent form. We have another coordinator check, make sure everything is in there. That's our implementation. Um, so we can do it in a day, same day, if we have to. Um, we're very lucky. And then every month I submit a monthly report to our R&D chair. So I just tell her we had NCI trials, we had two amendments. Um, if there's any deviations that were filed, any SAEs that were filed, I just put a little memo to her, send it to her, and she reports to R&D for that month. Um, if she has questions, she's come back a couple times just asking more about an SAE or anything like that, but she, there's not, a, they don't require a lot of detail as they shouldn't. They're not the IRB of records. So we just give them the bare minimum and they are good with it. It's been a lot of conversations, I think, and she, we have a new R&D manager and she's fantastic. So she understands. It is nice. <laughs> You're welcome. So that would be something we'd like to uh, create us as a best practices document that we can maybe share with the rest of the community uh, to maybe make other VAs and R and Ds more comfortable with that. I, you know, you know the VA. There's people are always so scared to get dinged for something. Yeah. And so if you know comfort in numbers, um, so. If we all do it, yeah, we can say sure. all the other kids do it. Yeah. So <laughs> come along. <laughs> uh, thank you, ladies. And we're very, very proud of our research team in Connecticut. Um, they're just really amazing. And we owe them any and all the success we have. So thank you. I, I wanted to sort of throw out something that maybe can be a uh, aspirational goal for this committee. Um, so a million years ago, there was an oncologist who rotated with us, who worked with us for a year. Um, her name was Shamila Garg. I don't know, maybe Monica remembers her, but so she came from a practice, private practice somewhere in maybe Kansas. <laughs> Sorry, I barely remember. But she, when she came, she told me we enrolled 30% of our patients on clinical trials, mostly NCTN. I said, how do you do that? She says, well, if I see a, a woman with say a certain type of breast cancer, I look to see if there's a study. And if there's a study, I can open it in three days. Now, that doesn't that make sense? I mean, the opening of the studies, we're not the IRB of record. These are well thought out studies. They are designed to be done in community settings such as the VA. It, 
that's what should really be happening. And then we could open the study that we heard earlier this session with a relatively rare form of kidney cancer because we just say, okay, the minute we go to urology tumor board and find out that one of those patient, one of those patients was diagnosed with papillary renal cell cancer, we'll open the study for that patient. And it shouldn't be a lot of paperwork. So I, I think in general that should be an aspirational goal for VAs. We're a centralized system. We have a central IRB. We should be able to do it. So your next project. <laughs> well, we, we talked a little bit about that, our, our program development team meeting yesterday as well. And, and I agree. And I think it's just not like for uh, this renal study, but all the DART protocols, you have this rare tumor show up and you're not going to open all those protocols hoping. I mean, that that was the old way prior to the central IRB. You'd open up everything that any of the cooperative group sent you and hope somebody walked through the door. Uh, I don't think we need to do that, but we need to convince ORD and those um, in privacy and information security that there's a way that we need to move forward that we're not held up for, as I had one professor call it, administrivia, uh, that uh, is just, uh, you know, things that should be, uh, we always say one VA is one VA, but that's not always true. We have a lot of things that cross lines and um, and there's no reason we we can't do that. I mean, information security, the bulk of it's gonna be all the same and there's gonna be some local stuff like where your office is and your files are. That's basically it yeah. like locally. Yeah. Standard. All right. Any other questions, comments, hopes and dreams? <laughs> Next, we'll have Sharon Palmer from um, what's the new name of the operations office? Center. What? Network Group Operations. The Network <laughs> Operations Center. I'm Sharon Palmer. I'm a senior protocol project manager with SWOG, and I was asked to join the VA committee to look at different ways SWOG can write protocol calls and help the VA be more involved and able to activate studies. With that said, there's been, when I've sat for the past year listening, there's been times I've heard funding across the board is an issue. How do we get this approved as research or how do we get this approved as clinic? Um, and no, we don't have an overall fix. We are trying to help work with the NCI for the NCI to work with the VA to help fix the issue overall. But what we can do is offer little tools and little trainings that might help you with items that you could use. And one thing we came up with um, was something that's already done for all of our studies, actually all NCTN studies, and it's called a national coverage analysis. It's completed on all studies before they even activate and it's available on CTSU. So what we did is we did a recorded training and thank you to Megan Page and Caitlin Hutchinson for attending. The Hope Foundation put it on with their budget analysts and Casey Dawson and Megan and Caitlin attended and listened and asked questions from a VA's perspective. Um, and we have that now recorded and available on the VA workbench. So I just wanted to touch on it briefly, give you a quick overview and point to where you can go to access this. This isn't meant to be the overall training on it, just a quick, here it is. Maybe it'll be useful for you. I hope it is. If not, I mean, it is there if you need it. Um, so it, like I said, it, uh, the training is available on the VA workbench. You'll just log in. It's SWOG under member researches, resources and the VA workbench. It's down, I think, halfway through the page. Um, and then just a quick overview. Like I said, uh, the national coverage analysis, it's an analysis, um, is the review of all the tests, procedures, and interventions associated with a clinical trial to determine which are billable, which ones are billable and which ones are not billable to a third party payer against the national guidelines and coverage rules. So it goes line by line code item, um, the TSH for this at cycle one, day one, it, yes, is billable or no, is not billable, has to be covered by the study. 
Um, it is performed by the Clinical Trial Support Unit, which is CTSU, and it is created for all NCTN and NCORP trials. Like I said, it is created before a study even activates, and a study cannot activate unless all billing issues discovered on this NCA are resolved. So when you see a study activated on CTSU, that means uh, the NCA has determined, well, CTS. CTSU through the NCA has determined that there are no billing issues or should not be any billing issues on this study. Um, and the NCAs are intended to be a guide for sites as they consider participation in SWOG trials or like I said, any trial from the NCTN or NCORP. Um, sites should, should still make sure they do their own local coverage analysis using their own local coverage determinations. Um, like I said, the VA we do know is its own insurance payers. So this is a little different, but our hopes were you could possibly use the NCA when going and looking at the different departments to show them like, hey, look, this is covered standard by the all other insurances. We should be covering the standard for our veterans. Um, and once they're completed, they can be posted on the CTSU protocol dashboard. I don't, I hope all of you have a little familiar with ARD with CTSU. Um, but just be safe, this is kind of an example. Uh, this is S2209. When you go to CTSU, you will search on the left side for the protocol after you hit the protocol tab, that is. Um, once you pull up the protocol, you'll go to funding information and you will find it. If you scroll all the way down, you'll find it as a document at the bottom of the page. There you go. It's titled Coverage Analysis Worksheet. And also on there, you do find the funding worksheet too that shows site payments, which I'm sure y'all are familiar with when you do open your studies or look at activating a study. Um, and like I said, CTSU uh, website, it's got the NCA, the funding memo. And if you do ever have questions on an NCA, the Hope Foundation is really amazing. They really do wanna work with the VA and help. And with that said, all of the budget analysts, the grants and contracts, they can all be contacted by emailing funding at swag.org and they will answer questions on the NCA. Like I said, with this training, it was Casey Dawson, Chris Postoka, and Anna Hogan. Couldn't thank the Hope Foundation enough, as well as Caitlin Hutchinson and Megan Page for even sitting in on this training and giving us their thoughts. And I also wanted to open it up to see if they had any kind of comments on what they thought about the training and potential use. Um, I thought the training was very useful. I also think it's important to note that um, these sheets could be shared with your nonprofits. Um, I know that I share them with mine because they don't have access to CTSU and sharing the contact with them as well because I know personally my nonprofit has reached out to funding uh, several times just to kind of figure things out with their agreement and stuff. Thank you. But that's all I had, unless anyone has any questions. Like I said, we're just looking at different ways to help VA sites here at SWOG, even if it is just a small tool, like a simple training. So thank you. All right, thanks, Chris. All right. Uh, uh, could I ask a question? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand, but thank you. Uh, that's right, so, just jump right in. Yes, thank you. So thank you, everybody, and Sharon. And Sharon has been very helpful on SWOG 2209. So the question for the VA investigators in the room is, how do we, what do we do when the, and I learned a new acronym from Sharon today, local coverage analysis. What do we do when the LCA is not the same as the NCA, the national coverage analysis? And uh, I don't expect to have an answer, but I, I think this is something we're facing in 2209. And my guess is a lot of VAs are going to face this as well. So there's a national coverage analysis. Uh, Medicare and other payers agree that insurers, payers should cover the certain costs in a trial, but the VA doesn't, either locally or nationally. And I, I think that that's a big issue. And Steve knows this is a recurring and a recurring ongoing problem. So I don't know if we want to set up a separate subcommittee to discuss this. I just I, I would be wrong if I I don't I don't expect there's resolution, but I just wanted to make that comment here on <laughs> sure. the tail uh, on the heels of what uh, Sharon had to say. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be an education process that we need to 
talked with central office and whether it's PBM or lab or imaging or whoever that, you know, most of these things, if it's covered by Medicare, we should be covered in VA. There shouldn't be a difference there. And so if we find that we need to know how to highlight that and have some go-to in central office or somewhere that says, you know, this is covered by VA. Um, and, uh, you know, we can start those converse, conversations with ORD and uh, probably the Navigate Group is probably a good place to start with that and, and uh, move that forward and, you know, set an example for the rest of the field. So. Hey, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tom. Via Long Beach, we have a waiver for all federally funded studies. We don't pay for radiology, pathology, or research pharmacy. So our PI just has an agreement with all three departments that we don't get charged for any of them. Yeah, I, th that's kind of the... Yeah, so we don't have anything in writing, so if the heads of those departments change or move on... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> get it in writing. Um, yeah, I mean, and certainly there's... There's a, a lot of that too, because like in like the research pharmacy issues you guys had, you know, VA cooperative studies don't pay for for those kind of things, but that should be covered under Vera dollars. Uh, whether you ever see or hear of those Vera dollars uh, is up to your vision uh, vision director. So, uh, <laughs> but but theoretically that should all be there. So. And, uh, you know, historically, uh, cooperative group trials, CSP trials, and VA trials didn't have separate or billable funding for uh, pharmacy, lab, and, and imaging. So those were covered because that was, you know, standard of care, essentially. Even if it was a research study, it was standard of care and the national cost analysis should uh, you know tell you which things should be covered by the study, and that you know I know SWAG and the other cooperative groups have worked hard to you know identify those things which are really research and not routinely covered, um, you know under Medicare or other insurance billers like you know our universities they deal with that, and, and I think the universities and private hospitals are much better at doing accounting than the VA, but um, <laughs> we haven't dealt with money that much. So, um, anything else on that? Uh, just a quick update: we have our disease committee liaisons uh, and needs. Where uh, Dr. Tashi is going to be our leukemia representative, um, and then we have another. Uh, other openings, I think we have um, a candidate for early therapeutics, and what else do we have? Um, and we're looking at um, doing a better job with our liaisons, making sure that they know what to do and what the co disease committee chairs understand their role. And um, so our, our development team is working on a process for that so that you know we can get early input like we've seen with the lung lung studies uh which i think will be very helpful uh for va studies going forward um on to current va stats and accrual leslie's going to help us there yeah <laughs> okay this is the button on the slide Oops. So um, this is the accrual report that we ran from um, April 16th through September 15th. Uh, I'm not gonna go line by line on this. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's been, um, I guess, kind of a lot of maintenance. Uh, there have been a few jumps. Um, I don't think necessarily Rocky Mountain made a huge jump just because Steve is here, but um, I would kind of wonder about that. Um, but um, just go page by page here and you can kind of scan through. Um, I think overall it's it hasn't really it hasn't really changed much, I don't think. 
um, in the last several months. And I don't know if that's a negative or a positive. Maybe things are kind of settling down with staffing issues that we have seen um, in the last couple of years of COVID and such. Um, maybe some of these are just still stabilization um, efforts that are happening. So I think it's good that things aren't going drastically downwards. Um, so that's at least how I, I kind of interpret it. Um, Audie Murphy, our newer storefront, I thought it was great to see a, a huge jump in, in their numbers too. So um, that was quite interesting. Um, again, a lot of these have, have been stable numbers um, for the last um, several reporting periods and just continues. Um, and again, I, I don't wanna go line by line. I thought it was interesting though, to see that the final total number is relatively, well, pretty much the same 72 this session and the last reporting period was 71. So as I said, uh, regardless of the ups or downs that the overall number um, is still uh, the same. Um, did I jump too far? Yeah, whoops. Yeah. So for this reporting period, uh, we have 17 studies, a variety of studies um, on the graph that uh, the sites are working on. Um, some of them have very, very low numbers, um, but I thought one thing that was interesting, if you go to the next slide for the last reporting period, there were 14 studies and a lot of them had larger numbers. So uh, I just think it's interesting Again, the difference between the sites is they are trying, some sites are trying to open more in different studies for each each um, each opportunity. So I, I thought that was a, a good thing to see that uh, we're reaching out and trying new things. And then this is just a graph showing the overall um, last uh, periods um, from fall 2021, uh, of course, with the drop with COVID and so forth, and then coming back to the current status and Again, not much change in the last couple of reporting periods. So again, maybe we're seeing a stabilizing um, effect with staffing, although that's still low, but maybe people are adapting better than we all think we are uh, and trying to come out and uh, come ahead of it. So Yes. John, can you go to the slide? Mm -hmm. We have, we've opened three studies. Um, the Loxidine just before it got shut down, uh, S2209 in the EAA181. Um, S2209 is in the making and um, S2302. So, so, the, so did you accrue patients to no, that? Yeah, we accrued patients. But okay, so this is, studies this is for registered patients. Okay. That, yeah, so, yeah, so once, yeah, so once, so maybe the next reporting period, then we'll see your patients on there. So, yeah, <laughs> Take <laughs> that's a, great news. So keep going. Yeah, thank you for numbers. mentioning that though. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thanks. Any other questions for Leslie? Uh, kind of the uh, last couple of things on the agenda is our uh, VA program development team. There's a, a number of folks that uh, are in the room that are on that team. And we had a, a meeting, was it yesterday? It seems like a long time ago. That seems like much longer ago than that. But, um, but we have uh, another number of other things in the works that we want to do. Um, including some site surveys on, you know, studies you didn't open possibly because you didn't think you'd get it open in time, uh, specific uh, issues, whether it's with privacy, information security, pharmacy, uh, lab, whatever it might be, just just to get some data that we can take forward to uh, the powers that be to suggest them that, you know, this is something we need to fix and how can we fix it and uh, give them some suggestions. And maybe not necessarily from us, but from uh, some some other voices within uh, the cooperative groups that um, that might have a, a meaningful voice uh, for for the front office. Um, we are, and I, I uh, emailed with Stephanie Ferguson from Navigate today, uh, and we are going to you know work with them closely to develop. A, a shared resource in addition to what we have on the VA, SWAG VA workbench, but that resource would be uh, ideally, at least what my mind is that, you know, when somebody opens a study, kind of like the storefronts already do, they, 
they share documents and information for opening a study, but that it'd be more VA wide. Uh, it would include navigate sites and non navigate sites, uh, so that you know when somebody opens Pragmatica, like the EDRSP is there, uh, an approved privacy thing is there, which may alleviate some of the heartburn of a privacy officer if they know somebody else has done it. It depends on the privacy officer, obviously. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, we're gonna uh, talk with the privacy office about doing a training for, I think they have a training for research, but I don't think it's specific to oncology or cooperative group trials. So if we can work with them and get something along those lines and or at least some guidance for privacy officers that uh, whether it's a, a TMS training, because everybody loves another TMS training mm -hmm. um, or, you know, best practices or, or, you know, things to look for. So um, other things we're going to actually our development team, instead of meeting kind of uh, twice a year, as we have, we're going to go to monthly meetings for the development team and quarterly meetings for the whole group. Um, so that you know we can keep things moving forward and faster. So um, and uh, we welcome all the input and cooperation. And uh, we might be reaching out to some of you for help because we always need help. And uh, and you know certainly send us your ideas. Um, you know it may be something we're already working on, or it may be something you know you may have this idea that just never occurred to us. So we'd love to have, have your input. Um, recently, uh, let's see, Leslie, Sharon, um, Connie, did you go to Abaho? Oh, you stayed home. Oh, Lacey went. Um, so uh, they went to Abaho uh, conference also in Chicago just a week or so ago. Um, and uh, we had a booth for SWAG, and uh, there's a a number of things that uh, Abaho is very interested in working with us. Um, and uh, there's some things that uh, we're going to talk with them about, and and maybe move some things forward on that front as well. So um, I think it it went very well. It, I theoretically did a presentation at Avho, but I wasn't the one there doing it. Dr. Goodman did it for me because I was home with COVID. So <laughs> thank goodness. But um, yeah, Dr. Data did uh, the, the storefront for our South Texas uh, new storefront. And uh, there was a number of other things along research lines that uh, I, I think, you know, a number of years ago, there wasn't even kind of a research forum in Avaho, and it's gotten stronger and stronger every year. So, um, so that's good. Yeah, and just on a side note too, Avaho has recorded many of those sessions, and so they've told me once they release those recordings, I'll be posting those on the VA workbench. Um, and there were three or four SWOG specifics presentations, so we'll let you know when those get posted. And then. Um, I think we'll have, you know, another group meeting in the first quarter of 2024. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll be as good as it was great to have the uh, study presentations and some discussion about those studies and how they pertain to VA. Um, we're, we're getting more and more of that. And that's great. And even, you know, a, a presentation for a study that doesn't even have a number yet um, so that, that we can get in early. Uh, so that's great. So any comments or questions from the room or online? Can we what? Sure. Oh, where is the swag photography? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you want to, if you need or want to address these slides before we do that. With oh, them. oh yeah, just, just one other thing. Um, the Hope Foundation. I'm I'm required to do this. Joe Horn makes me do this. <laughs> no, but we're happy to do this. Actually, um, uh, be sure to, you know to think about Hope uh, when you 
when you're thinking about uh, giving money to something. Hope does a lot for us. Uh, tomorrow, I will be uh, trying to give a 15 minute presentation, uh, but it's kind of a bigger room with a lot of different people. And so it's gonna be a little bit frightening, but that's okay. Um, but it's all about how the Hope Foundation has helped move the VA program along from the VA integration grants to our storefronts to funding CRAs to come here, which I kind of just learned today. Nobody told me that before. So I'm just gonna have to mention it off off the cuff. And um, you know, and funding you know, Leslie's position, our half-time FTE for a, a, a VA liaison in the uh, Network Operations Center. Um, yeah, and uh, so, yeah, hopefully that'll that'll be well-received and we, you know, we'll, we want to be sure that uh, the Hope Foundation gets credit for all the things that they've done for us. So. All right, if that's it, we can... Maybe one of the IT people could take the picture. The, do a couple of different. Sessions. Yeah. Yeah. So gather up front and we'll do the big 